a new full-size electric shooting brake that lengthwise competes with the Tesla Model S or the Mercedes EQE, but then comes at the price point 40,000 euros less than the competition. How is that possible? And can everyone else go home now against the Zeker 001? Here is Thomas Nautikofel in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go. We're going to tell you all about you need to know. You can see the front design has a little bit of Porsche Panamera. There will be some Audi RS6 in the rear. Soon going to tell you all about it. Very characteristically is that this headlamp unit here from the daytime running light part always stands up on top, has a three-dimensional shape. Overall, a very angular and European design. And this color here, this very bright baby blue, is called electric blue. The main headlamp unit here is in the lower part. Turning indicators in the front, you can see they replaced the daytime running light. So a very spectacular feature. Has something like animal-like, you know, like a tiger, lion, or claw, something design. What do you think? Ladies and gentlemen, today's big price question is about is there a frunk or not? There is one, <laughs> as it should be a small one, but fits for a charging cable or something. The length at 4 meters 95 or 195 inches, the Volkswagen ID7 would be another competitor, which is more in competition price-wise as sedan or later also a shooting brake. But then again, the ID7 has a smaller battery. This battery here is way bigger. Soon more to that. Wheels, 21 or optional 22 inch wheels. The bigger one here, Spire design, dual tone scheme. Overall, I think a very beautiful design, contrasting roof in the top part. And this shooting brake form also has a very good CD value still, 0.23. So we can expect a great wind efficiency. We'll also do a driving and range efficiency test today. Rear design, we can see somewhat of a mix between the sedan and the wagon and the estate. So a very impressive piece here, I think, with standing out three-dimensional tail lamps. You either get a rear-wheel drive version as entry or an all-wheel drive then with two electric motors, one per axle. The acceleration figure is then either around seven seconds for the entry version or under four seconds for the all-wheel drive version. Top speed, 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour. Light signature, also here with this really modern design, individual element that looks quite cool, actually. Turning indicators at the rear, very well visible here, wide enough, and also with this cascading effect. Big microphone action for you today because a lot of wind noise, a lot of background noises and yeah, a lot of seagulls and so on. <laughs> so battery size is 100 kilowatt hours around, a little bit buffer in there and a realistic real world range, somewhat 500 kilometers or 320 miles. Can be better in summertime, can be maybe worse in wintertime or when you speed it up really high speed. Recharging 22 kilowatt a AC is standard. 200 kilowatt DC charging, the quick charging, and that gives you then 10 to 80% state of charge in around 30 minutes. And we already know the price for the Dutch market in euros, so in the Netherlands. It will start less than 60,000 euros for the rear drive model and then 67,000 euros for the all-wheel drive model with all the bells and whistles. Yeah, that's really impressive. And you think about that in the Netherlands or Germany, where I have comparable prices, then a Tesla Model S, the normal one, or a Mercedes EQE in the all-wheel drive higher spec is at 100, 110,000 euros. So indeed, 40,000 euros difference. That's absolutely massive. The ID7, as I said, price-wise more comparable, but then smaller battery and stuff. And yeah, so this will be super, super tough for the competition now. They offer smartphone or keycard access, but I prefer to have a real key fob. It's not a classic one, more this squircle design I would say or shape and then you can see here the door handles flush design go in and out but they do give you some haptic feedback then here we know them from the Range Rover Sport for Range Rover for example then door closing sound is considering it's a frameless door actually still quite decent then inside high grade leatherette here in the blue beige scheme i think it's a beautiful color combination indeed door handles audi-esque i would say but really good for the build quality galvanized buttons here for the inside window levers so it's a really high build quality 
Yamaha sound system, steering wheel and a sporty design and both the steering and the seats. They have the philosophy to go animal free and sustainable as for the materials as it should be in 2023 for not only electric vehicles actually. Just here in this very early production version the steering wheel is still animal skin but they are changing that. Seating comfort is really good, good shoulder support and the microfiber surface here on the inside is really soft and nice, very high quality feeling. If you want a little bit more subtle color, there's also a black microfiber seat available in also this color scheme, so you don't have to go for that one. But I think, to me, it's a great choice, color-wise, indeed. 189 or 6 for 2, and that leaves still plenty of headroom below this fixed glass roof. I'm more a fan of roof you can actually open or then just, you know, a closed roof. Because, yeah, they all have this, you know, heat protection, but it still will get somewhat hotter. I have the feeling, you know, this does remind me a little bit of the Audi seats and the whole interior is, yeah, I mean, see here and there, to me, a mix of like Audi and, of course, the middle screen. Yeah, we see clearly this is inspired by Tesla, this 15.4 inch screen. Neo has already done that, that they picked a, like almost the same layout. Now also Zeker does it. It is because Tesla set the new standard there in a way. However, what I criticize with Tesla, Neo, and also with Zeker is, in a way, when you're stationary, it's okay. But to control something like that while driving, it's just too complicated. When they would use the large screen and then make everything larger, then it would be easier. The temperature control always in the lower part here. Then you have seat cooling here. So a microfiber seat with seat cooling. Wow, that's the best as for the climate comfort you could imagine. And also seat heating, but they don't work on a parallel basis. Well, they have one alternative and that is in the head-up display. So I, at the moment, I'm sliding on the steering wheel. Slide right and then I can also control the vent strength. And here, like recent calls and so on. Yeah, we know a similar solution from Tesla um, in the instruments then. But um, yeah, I don't know. Um, what do you think? Is this a real alternative to a metal no temperature knob? For me, not, but at least something. And if you have the optional air suspension in this higher trim or is included in the higher trim, you can also set the height here, but it's also doing that automatically. And the steering wheel adjustment, that's another thing I do criticize, is done in here at the steering wheel. We also know that from Tesla, but here you actually don't know what you're doing. So you are, ah, okay, this is up, this, uh, this is down, this is up, and right side is out, left side is in, but you're kind of like moving that in the dark here on that field. Yeah, I think a separate stock column for that here would have been better, definitely. And they will also offer Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Yeah, you won't get that one in the Tesla. However, we cannot show that to you yet. The software that is not up to date yet. We can just take their word for that at this moment. And then you can have some more apps. For example, you also have the camera here internally where you can take selfies. Yeah, in China, that's that's a big thing. I'm not sure if European or American customers would actually do that. Um, yeah, and then we can also switch it around, like on the iPhone, and uh, take a view to the front for some landscape shots or parking lot shots. <laughs> oh, did I pay the parking? Psst. And I wanted to show to you that the car internal GPS is quite responsive. However, when you have a very long route, it does not automatically calculate the charging stops. That's a flaw. The Volvo Android Automotive System can do that. They use a different own one. Digital instruments, easy, clear to read. And I think that's totally enough. And I'm glad we still have digital instruments. You have some hotkeys in the lower area here, for example, also to open the trunk from the inside. And then this one here on the right is for the glove box. A premium design also for the lower middle console. Here this microfiber surface and then there's inductive charging pad. Shifting lever goes like this, drive, reverse. And this metal knurled volume knob also with some clicking sound. That's nice. However, here a little bit loose. Maybe they can still fix that for the final version. Then we have adaptive cup holders, nicely integrated, and this premium design of this split opener with more space and USB-C charging. And there's massively more storage underneath the middle console.
And if you now ask yourself the very good question, how is it possible that a brand I never heard of before comes to Europe, starts selling vehicles here at that build quality, at that price point, with these EV specs? Well, the story behind it is the Geely Mother Corporation from China, they started buying Volvo in 2010, bought Polestar brand in 2015, bought Lotus brand in 2017, also in 2017 founded the Link & Co brand, and they are basically forming this huge corporation of different brands like the Volkswagen AG with their different brands and then putting all on one platform or separate, you know, platforms they are sharing economies of scale and so on and also building on this European experience. They still have the Volvo headquarters here in Gothenburg in Sweden and the same also counts for the design and the development center for Zeker now, they put the headquarters to Amsterdam and they employ mainly European personnel. So they basically get all of this knowledge and let the Europeans also do the work for the European customer. And that's why it's also so well adapted to this market. Maybe some of the software tweaks here, that's not finished yet. But everything else, you know, that's the story why it actually already works. Very interesting, the door closing sound in the rear doors. It's better than the one in the front doors. Hmm. And also at the rear doors, soft touch materials and there's really like a background behind it. You can deeply touch it. That's what I said. Yeah, microfiber. So high class premium as really luxury experience. Once again, also with the door handles. Has a lot of wow effects, definitely. Then take a look, EV architecture. That means no middle tunnel. Using that, same color scheme also for the rear seats. Once again, the microfiber on the inside, and the little red on the outside parts. But is there sufficient space when the seat is in the way that I'm driving as a tall driver? A lot of leg room left, that's no problem. Here, the seat bench is quite low. You see this angle is maybe not ideal, but when you lean backward, it's actually a good comfort. Lower the seat here, the camera can come around. Thank you so much. <laughs> so then with 189 or 6 foot 2, there is still some headroom left when I put my spine up. I can still put a hand over my head. So this works. So for five tall adults, easy. What about the middle seating here? This also works. Gets a little closer here to the headroom. But yeah, it is five tall adult proof, definitely. And once again, the material quality is just astonishing. Here, by the way, you have this strap. You can pull down this one here for adaptive cup holders. Then you have some more space here. Yeah, this is not dampened or something, maybe one thing, but this is properly covered as well. And what's also interesting, you have the controls here and then you can electronically adjust the back part of the rear seats. So maybe when you push this seat here also in the front, can also be more or less used as a luxury chauffeur sedan or chauffeur shooting brake. The rear climate unit gets its own screen. Yeah, that looks a little bit bland or a little bit dull to control. You know, I'm a friend of real climate dials, but yeah, they want to keep it like this clean and modern solution. But at least you have all these features like seat heating in the rear, for example, in this top trim here. And you can also change the back part of the seats once again, also via the screen. And below you can Nice clicking sounds. Here you can fold out USB-A charging and USB-C charging. And here, it's good that they write it on there. 60 watts. So this is actually quite cool. You can probably charge a MacBook with their MacBook Pro and even don't need the real big plug. Towing capacity is 1.5 tons for the rear-wheel drive version, 2 tons for the all-wheel drive version. Let's now check out the trunk or the boot. 540 liters of standard luggage capacity. Here the length is a little bit more than the meter of 40 inches and the width is impressive. So it will be like 115 in meters or 45 inches. Here we can see a full set of luggage. You can put this also out and then we can fold the seats easy from here. This and that and there we go then with the full length indeed. Uh, yeah, one thing is make this one here I have to push down maybe like you know this transition but overall seems very well usable 
full length here, all fold down 190 in meters or 75 inches, pretty impressive. And underneath, more space, either for a charging cable or you can set this whole thing a level lower and leave it in or take it out entirely for the most trunk height. Acceleration 0 to 70. Plop, that's it. <clears throat> there was no bullies, no. Yeah, it's like in the moment you want to stop, you already reached more speed. But here, of course, in Sweden, you have to pay close attention that we will closely keep the speed limit now. Um, yeah, with acceleration, especially with the electric vehicles, always so tricky. So you've, you've seen that. Wow, that went so quick here in the all-wheel drive version. Yeah, I mean, the pure rear-wheel drive version is significantly slower, yes, but then of course, course also a little bit lower in the price. Of course, considering price difference between the rear-wheel drive and the all-wheel drive model, you get so much more, or so much quicker acceleration for not too much price, too much more price, yes. So um, price performance is better here in the all-wheel drive version in that way. But overall, in most cases, you won't need it. The rear-wheel drive version will be um, yeah, definitely quick enough. And it will be very important for taxation reasons. So at this moment, I also think that in Germany, they will also keep under the 60,000 euros threshold. And that's, for example, for German customers, business customers, really important because then you can have a company car and not only tax, you know, like you have this rule, like 1% of the, um, you know, of the overall price, you have to pay taxes per month on that price, basically 1% for private use of the business car. For some plug-in hybrids and expensive electric vehicles is 0.5 and for less than 60,000 euros electric vehicles is 0.25. So that's like one quarter of the list price then per month and that will be extremely cheap when you deduct so much from taxes but don't have to privately tax again so much. So yeah, this will be a very crucial price point then also for the German market definitely. Here now at about 70 kilometers an hour, so like 40 miles an hour, it's very relaxing ride once again and even though when you are in a sport mode, suspension is doing a good job, so it definitely delivers a premium driving experience. Here now turning right, still at relatively high speed, accelerating out of the corner, really nice. So it goes very quickly and fast out of the corner, so astonishing how sporty this car feels when you're going out and just from this overall feeling you know does it still have like a huge difference to to like German premium cars or something if you would imagine hey this is now like an electric A6 or an electric Panamera or something hardware wise how the car is feeling how it's handling and so on yeah they're definitely right there and this all-wheel drive version really gives you a nice push back to the seats and it handles absolutely great. So we see some things here in the software, you know, like some beeping sounds here and there, um, something that's not working. It's of course still in like a very early stage for the vehicle because they have been developing this one in a very, very short amount of time, also comparison to classic manufacturers. That's of course chance and risk at the same time acceleration out really cool so it's not exaggerated that acceleration really gives you a very good controlled feeling of this vehicle so this balance when, when acceleration is also you know, really top-notch indeed center of gravity is low and the weight distribution front axle rear axle is actually 50 50 so the best weight distribution and you also feel that that although it's actually quite large and heavy it doesn't feel like that. Yeah, I mean, it's actually fun to drive and steer it around and it feels relatively light. The steering does have a good feeling, so there's no dead zone area. Also, small commands are being transported. It's rather set on a comfortable note. We'll also soon go through different driving modes. Throttle, let's say accelerator pedal, and in this case, it has a good feeling as well. 
recuperation you can actually set at the moment we just have a slight recuperation it is notable however you can also set it here in the driving settings differently to for example entry recuperation level high when i go off the throttle then is a notable deceleration even more or go for the one pedal driving feeling let's see that here and then yeah i mean i could have imagined it's even stronger um, so I probably will more make a difference than at higher speeds. I feel this is... Ah, no, no, now it's, it's in. Yeah, so not sure what's the parameter there, but now is basically the strongest recuperation level. It always depends on just what you prefer, because when you use the brakes, the car will also go into the regenerative braking mode. So that, that's not about it. It's more about what you prefer. Meanwhile, you know, there was a time I was, oh, there's a Neo ET7, one of the competitors. Um, sometimes I was preferring this, sometimes that. Meanwhile, I'm more, again, into a medium recuperation than when I want to decelerate a little bit more than use the brake pedal. I feel you have a little bit more control over the vehicle and also if you think about G-forces on the passenger and so on, you know. Overall, a very exciting experience so far, although it's very windy outside here today in Gothenburg city. Um, no, not Gotham, Gothenburg in Sweden. But the city driving experience so far is very likable and it indeed gives you a premium feeling. There's no rattling, there's no annoying noises somewhere and then we enjoy these premium materials here and so on. And people try to cross the street, although it's green traffic light. I don't know what like green traffic light for me and red traffic light for pedestrians. Is that a Swedish rule? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They, I don't know. Maybe they're not from here. This is the speed warning. Hmm. Yeah, that's about it. It's a new European law that there has to be a warning as soon as you exceed the speed. And it will always be, again, the case. This is not manufacturer specific. It's the law. The only thing is that for example, Mercedes found, offered us a hotkey like on the infotainment system and also on the steering wheel to deactivate it then because at every startup it is renewed. This will be a part of our reviews from now on as well. Here they don't offer a hotkey for that yet, but I think manufacturers will quickly pick up and decide for that. Oh, here the turning indicator sound. That's a little bit weirder, right? So that doesn't sound too premium, but lane changing, for example, here. Is, yeah, that's turning indicator sound <laughs> together with speed warning. Here, the overspeed warning, we can shut it off here. Yes, confirm. Yeah, but that's not something you should do while driving, actually. Um, so, yeah, I'm waiting for some, you know, more creative hotkey solutions for that, actually. Here, when the, being in a comfort mode, it's really nice and smooth already. So, you feel that the hardware of the vehicle is really good. You can have the different suspension modes for that too, in the quick settings. At the moment, comfort mode, everything is really soft with it, air suspension. However, 22 inch wheels, the biggest wheels available. So if you want more comfort, of course, you can always go for smaller wheels. Here, when you go over this hump, I feel that the air suspension is evening out everything very well. It is not set on the softest tone, so um, there are more floaty air suspensions. I think it's rather sporty, but without exaggerating the sportiness. Let's take it that way. When we go here, for example, to the sport mode, there's more throttle input. Let's see if I also feel that suspension-wise. Comfort. Yeah, the steering feel also changes. Do you feel suspension difference? Comfort. <laughs> Sport. Maybe a little bit, yeah, a little bit, yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, yeah, but I mean, especially in the electric vehicles, the driving modes usually don't make the largest difference. Sometimes, you know, of course, there's a little bit more power unleashed or something. Um, yeah, but overall, you'll be fine also in the standard comfort mode. The sport mode, of course, when we want to have the best acceleration possible. Yeah, when we look at the outside and see like a Panamera EV, it kind of also feels like that, you know, or something similar I would also expect when we can drive the A6 e-tron for the very first time. That is what I would also expect from these vehicles. So all the hardware facts concerning 
awesome vehicle. Software-wise, why is it actually that on the one hand you hear, oh, they are so leading, like, you know, Chinese manufacturers, especially as for software, and, and then suddenly they come to Europe and I've seen it with NIO and now also here, that the software is not top-notch. And the reason is that in China they have different laws as for what's allowed, what's not allowed especially as for personal data, privacy, and so on. And here, most of the stuff that's allowed in China is not allowed here in Europe or even in the US. And this is the reason that they cannot use the Chinese infotainment system. And the voice assistant, for example, same with Neo, will work so much better in the Chinese versions than here in the European versions. They have to basically build up from ground on. And some things are actually quite good and function very well some other things are not working that well and we really have to see so many times times we've heard from manufacturers no matter which manufacturer you know um, also for example with vw yeah that's all prototype stage and then there will be a software update and then it's fine and it wasn't fine so <laughs> we have to see we will follow this brand as well and see can they keep their promise that they also update the software and you know fix the rest and so on but I feel user interface-wise, some things are fine. Other things like controlling the temperature when you're like a 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit guy, AC auto, whatever. But when you are a guy like me who tries to change temperature while driving, it's still annoying. And no, I don't want to use the voice input. I just, I don't like talking to my car. That's maybe also the difference to European, American versus Chinese market. Actually, I heard that you know, on the Chinese market, people enjoy talking to the vehicle and kind of feel safer when having the interaction. For me, I just want to turn the knob and that's it. And I don't care about drive talking to my car. I want to talk to people while driving, you know, or, or concentrate on the road or do both. <laughs> it, but I don't want to talk to the car. Yeah, that's that's at least um, my two cents as for that. And also when like seat heating, seat cooling, it just takes away too much attention from me. So user interface wise, I'm not super happy about this vehicle. And this slightly booming sound from the electric motors, it's not that much audible, but from what you hear, you always think, is there an ambulance coming somewhere? Just, you know, not that loud, but like, oh, is there an ambulance like really far behind us? So that is something else I found a little bit annoying. But the driving like hardware, yeah, and this <laughs> and the turning indicator, but driving it from the hardware perspective, steering, chassis, suspension, noise insulation, and so on, as for outside noise and so on, yeah, this is really an outstanding job. And here the consumption shows 19 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That's more than three miles per kilowatt hour. And that means more than 500 kilometers real world range, clearly more than 300 miles, something you can really work with indeed. So overall, I really think that design-wise, exterior, interior, build quality, material quality, driving quality, so there's ride quality, fun, suspension, everything, really top-notch and at that price point with that battery, almost unbeatable. Just here, the user interface, especially while driving and software-wise, there I think they are still a little bit behind. Also, assistance systems wise, we could not test that yet today here. It's not ready yet. So we'll see if they can make it, if they can manage it, or if then the traditional manufacturers or Tesla can keep up with a little bit more experience they now already have. It will be very exciting and we'll keep you updated. For example, also with the competitors of the BWID7 or the Tesla Model S.